It is my great pleasure and privilege to introduce Melanie Mitchell, our keynote speaker for this morning. And as is my want, I could tell you about her, but you can read it in the book, which we have given you, and, uh, and look her up in lots of ways. So I'll tell you what immediately impressed me about her, which is that she did her PhD under Doug Hofstetter, who is my idol, whom I have only shaken hands with once, but uh, I think very highly of him. When my grandson Sam came to me at the age of 12 and said, Grandpa, Mom told me that I have to get a reading list from you. What should I read? I just gave him Gödel Escher Bach and said, this is the only thing to read. Let me know when you're done. <laughs> it took him a year, and now he is, uh, had his PhD funded by NASA and is in the most highly funded uh, startup in the world, Magic Leap, down in Florida. And I suspect that's why he's not here today. As chief, uh, chief system architect. Chief system architect for this very highly architected system. Yes. So uh, Melanie is going to talk to us about complexity. Uh, I strongly recommend her book. I haven't finished it yet, but it is one that I will finish. I am happy to report. And I look forward to hearing what she has to say to us this morning. Melanie. Okay. Thank you, Joel, and thank you to Brad for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm a computer scientist. My, my work is in artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, I'm actually not gonna talk about that work today, but I'm gonna talk about the field of complexity, which I've been involved in for uh, like 20 years, um, since the first time I visited the Santa Fe Institute in New Mexico as a graduate student. So complexity is a very big field. I'm hoping with this talk to kind of give you a flavor of what people in complex systems are thinking about um, and get you interested enough to maybe look at the first pages of my book. We'll see. Hopefully it won't take you a year to read it. Um, so the field of complex systems um, is very, as I said, is very broad. What does it study? Well, people in complex systems are interested in studying the brain which is perhaps one of the most complex of all systems that uh, we know about, um, in which there's trillions of neurons that interconnect in many ways with um, other neurons and other kinds of cells. And somehow out of that whole system arises the uh, behavior that we call intelligence or cognition or emotion or uh, any other of the most human uh, attributes, and we don't really understand how that happens. Another system of great interest in complex systems are insect colonies. Um, in Gödel Escherbach, which uh, Joel talked about, the book that Douglas Hofstetter wrote, he likens an insect colony to the brain and calls it Ant Hillary. Um, ha -ha. <laughs> but insect colonies are f uh, fabulously uh, inventive for being made up of components, ants, that, for example, that are so simple individually, and they can do things like build bridges with their bodies, that's what you're seeing here on the slide, where um, they've cooperated to build bridges, a bridge between two tree trunks so that they can uh, cross from one to the other without having to go down to the ground. So it's a great question. How did such cooperative complex behavior evolve with such uh, relatively simple uh, individual components? The immune system, another uh, complex system that has been called a, a second brain in your body. It consists of trillions of cells that are continuously circulating. Um, it involves learning. Um, it involves memory, and it involves 
a kind of intelligence where the immune system is able to recognize patterns of um, possible harm to the body and protect you from it co continuously. And you're not aware of it for the most part, except when you get sick, but it's, it's always there and uh, people don't really understand many of the ways in which it's able to act as a real cognitive, second cognitive system in our bodies. Genetic regulatory networks uh, were one of the great discoveries in genetics. There was a big mystery when, for example, the Human Genome Project revealed that humans, uh, the human genome only consists of um, about 25,000 uh, genes. How could we get such, be, be so complex when our uh, genome is, um, has fewer genes than that of mustard plants? for example. Well, one of the reasons is that it's not the number of genes, but it's the interconnection between them in this vast network in which genes influence one another. And the complexity of that system hasn't been fully understood and is a subject of great interest in the complexity community. Uh, food webs, another kind of network in which individual um, uh, species uh, eat other species. You know, we used to think of a food chain, but of course it's more complicated than that, a food web. And people are only beginning to understand how to, um, how to sort of sustainably use our resources so that food webs can stay uh, intact and successful when taking out certain uh, species at the lower levels can impact throughout the entire web. Um, the evolution of cooperation in general in social systems, here's a little video of um, bees, uh, 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 ants cooperatively um, transporting a wasp um, that's much, much heavier, many mag orders of magnitude heavier than any of the individual ants. Well, this is one example of cooperation, but we have obviously have cooperation uh, among diverse individuals in a community at all levels, and people are uh, trying to understand how such behavior could evolve, how it can be sustained, and what fosters or um, hurts cooperation in social systems. Complex systems is, is uh, very interested in the, the phenomenon of financial networks, how these uh, are similar in some ways to the biological networks that I talked about. So here's a network of banks where each bank is represented by one of these uh, spheres and they're connected to each other if they have some significant financial um, uh, relationship with each other, like loaning each other money. And we've only seen recently how the complexity of these bank networks, for example, can affect um, the vulnerability to a kind of cascading failure. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. Social networks. This is a picture of, um, you can, can't really see it, of connections from between people on Facebook. And it's international. It's... Um, extremely um, large and it's really changed in many ways the way that our society works. So understanding how social networks operate and um, what their structure and dynamics are is an important area in studying complexity. And urban scaling, an area that people have gotten interested in recently, asking questions about how cities operate at different scales. This is a really interesting graph done by a group uh, from the Santa Fe Institute that shows how uh, as a population increases, how different metrics of cities scale, including crime, GDP, income, patent generation, and astoundingly, they all scale in essentially the same way, uh, that is, as a power law, this is a logarithmic plot, 
and with the same slope, the same exponent of the power law. Why would that be? That's a big, that's still not understood, but it's believed to be because of certain common network properties of cities that are very similar to network properties in biology. So this is something I'm gonna talk about also a little bit later. So these are all very disparate systems ranging from the, the cellular or molecular level all the way up to uh, human society. And complex systems scientists have come together from many different disciplines to try and make sense of their common properties, the common properties of complex systems. So here's a list of some of the common properties that these systems all consist of large collections or networks of relatively simple components where the components, well, by relatively simple I mean simpler than, much simpler than the complexity of the system itself as a whole. The components tend to interact locally and in nonlinear ways. I'll explain a little bit about that later, but there's real, you know, there's not a sense that every individual in the system is connected to every other individual. Most of the connections are fairly local. Um, there's limited central control. So you might think in an ant colony that's doing some complex task, there's some ant that's in charge that's telling all the other ants what to do, but clearly that's not the case. That somehow through local and these nonlinear interactions, these um, global emergent behaviors uh, come about, and that's really what we're trying to understand. Limited access to global information, and the notion of bounded rationality, that's become popular in economics, uh, the idea that individuals, whether they be uh, at the level of social insects or humans or even corporations aren't always acting completely rationally. That they're not, you know, rational uh, beings. They don't, aren't able to have access to information um, or uh, sort of logical uh, reasoning to make them completely rational. And finally, the system as a whole has some kind of emergent collective behavior. So these are com some common properties. Uh, the emergent collective behavior can be seen as very complex dynamics, but more and more people are looking at these behaviors in terms of information processing and computation. And that's where we computer scientists get involved, because if natural systems can be seen as information processing or computation, then our field becomes suddenly relevant to science. The science in computer science actually make, means something. So uh, that's very exciting, but even more perhaps useful to us and maybe the people here, a lot of the ideas from natural complex systems can be harnessed in, in computation and engineering. And so the idea of biologically or naturally inspired computation or engineering design has become very, uh, very relevant in the work that a lot of people are doing in the field. Finally, these systems are able to adapt and learn, which is um, really what, in, in a sense, a, ma a major part of what makes them special makes complex systems special that, and you know, we think, we know that we, we humans can learn, animals can learn, but societies can learn, they can adapt. Uh, insect colonies can adapt. These things can uh, have the um, ability to change and optimize their behavior. And we also, as engineers and computer scientists, can take inspiration from how these systems are able to uh, emergently adapt. So that's really a, a very broad overview of how, what people do in complex systems. I'm gonna talk a little bit about a couple of different themes, but I first wanted to tell you about the, uh, some ideas from this fellow, Warren Weaver, who was um, a mathematician. Uh, he worked with uh, Claude Shannon, information theorist. And in 1948, pretty long time ago, he, he wrote a very influential article called Science and Complexity. And his idea was that there were different kinds of problems that 
scientists or um, technologists were faced with. There were problems of simplicity, those with a few variables, such as how different variables like pressure and temperature or electrical current resistance and voltage or population and time, how these interact. These were the problems in which you could build models fairly easily and even solve these, build, build uh, entire theories around. Then there were the problems of disorganized complexity, where you, it's kind of the polar opposite, you have billions and trillions of variables. But it turns out that you can deal with these kinds of problems also through statistics, um, such as understanding how thermodynamics arises from statistical mechanics. Um, that's the science of averages. These are systems in which averages make sense because there's little inter or interaction among the variables. But finally, the most difficult problems, as Weaver pointed out in 1948, are the problems of organized complexity. We're kind of in the middle where you have a moderate number of variables and strong nonlinear interactions among the variables, which means that averages really don't make as much sense in these systems that um, we have problems where a sizable number of factors are interrelated into an organic whole. And so he gave some examples of these kinds of problems that were very, really ahead of his time, very prescient. He asked, what is a gene? Still being asked. Uh, how does the original genetic constitution of a living organism express itself in the developed characteristics of an adult? On what does the price of wheat depend? Okay, we still don't know. How can currency be wisely and effectively stabilized? How can one explain the behavior pattern of an organized group of people, you know, such, such as uh, labor unions, group of manufacturers, racial minorities? These are questions he was asking in 1948, which are still the kinds of questions, and also the range, the extreme, incredible range of uh, fields that people in complex systems are looking at. And he's seen these all as the kind of problems that should be um, looked at together in an interdisciplinary way. So they're too complicated to yield to the old techniques um, of few variables or even the statistical techniques of dis disorganized complexity. But in fact, what we need is and the future of the world depends on it, as he says, science to make a third great advance that's greater than the advances that, con that um, we're able to deal with these other kinds of problems. Science must, over the next 50 years, learn to deal with the problems of organized complexity. Well, 50 years has passed, and then 20 years more, and we still are grappling with these problems. And I think it is really the most, uh, important and urgent um, job of science and technology to try and deal with the problems of organized complexity, as Warren Weaver says. Okay, so the Santa Fe Institute, I was gonna tell you a little bit about how it came to be. It's uh, um, developed specifically to address these kinds of problems in an interdisciplinary way. It was founded in 1984 by a group of very distinguished scientists, including a number of Nobel laureates. So here are some, some of them. George Cowan, who is um, one, one of the founders of the Institute, a chemist who worked on the Manhattan Project. Marie Gell-Mann, Nobel Prize winning physicist. Phil Anderson, another Nobel Prize winning physicist. Ken Arrow, who recently passed away, a Nobel Prize winning e economist. And here's a news article that calls them strange bedfellows. And I think that's a good motto for what the Santa Fe Institute tries to do. It tries to put strange bedfellows together to solve problems in new ways. And the goal, the founding uh, idea of the Institute was to build one that pursues research on a number of highly complex and interactive systems that can only be studied properly in an interdisciplinary environment and promotes a unity of knowledge and a recognition of shared responsibility that will stand in sharp contrast to the growing polarization of intellectual cultures. So that was written in 1984. I think those things are still exactly what this institute is trying to do and those problems still exist. This group of people 
I think is uh, very, in a way, trying to do a very similar thing in a very inter, and this is a very interdisciplinary group. But the Santa Fe Institute, of course, is trying to get even stranger bedfellows than you together. Okay. Um, it's a distributed network. It, it, it's uh, headquartered in Santa Fe, New Mexico, but includes not only a, a small number of resident faculty, but also 100 or so external faculty and thousands of visitors every year. And um, after the talk, I'd be happy to tell people more about what the Institute is like and um, what their research is all about. Um, what I'm going to do in this talk is kind of dive into two themes that I think have been very influential in complex systems. And uh, one of them is that simple deterministic rules can yield complex, unpredictable behavior. And I think everybody in this room is quite familiar with this idea, but this really was a revolutionary idea and maybe still is to a lot of people. Um, the other one is about complex networks and that they are not normal. I'll explain what that means later on. Okay, so what I'm going to do to, to illustrate this idea of simple uh, deterministic rules yielding un complex, unpredictable behavior is talk about the idea of deterministic chaos. So you may have seen this guy, D Dr. Ian Malcolm, um, who said, you've never heard of chaos theory, nonlinear equations, strange attractors. Okay, and you may know that he's from the book Jurassic Park. Um, and it turns out that, uh, and you, Jeff Goldblum played him in the movie. Um, uh, Michael Crichton, when he wrote this book, supposedly um, patterned Ian Malcolm after some of the Santa Fe Institute physicists. <laughs> so um, the way I'm going to introduce this is probably familiar to, to, to some of you. Um, to look at chaos in the phenomenon of logistic population growth. So many organisms, um, the the, their growth in population looks like this so-called logistic function where um, it starts out slow, then speeds up up to a point and then flattens out. Okay, and that's a very uh, common way of looking at population growth. And it's very simply modeled by what's called the logistic model, where if we let x sub t be the population at year t, where x sub t is the population level, it's the fraction of the maximum population that the habitat will support, we'll say. And x sub t plus 1 is the population at the next year, and R is some growth rate. So this is called the logistic function or the logistic map, where the population of the next year is the growth rate times the population of this year times 1 minus the population of this year. And you may notice that this is a nonlinear function because x, there's an x squared hidden in there, which in some sense models the interactions. It says there's nonlinear interactions among the individuals in the population. Maybe they're competing for a finite resource. Okay, so we can look this incredibly simple, completely deterministic uh, model of how population grows. Okay, and I'm going to show you a quick demo of this. Okay, uh, so um, this is a little simulation platform called NetLogo which I really like. So here's my equation, and it, the, the uh, plot of the equation is a parabola in which x sub t is on the x-axis and x sub t plus 1 is on the y-axis. This dot, blue dot, is the current um, x sub t and x sub t plus 1. So we start out with a population at 0.2, 20% of the carrying capacity of the habitat. And the next year, this uh, equation predicts, will have uh, population will grow to 32%. Okay? And that's with a growth rate of 2. Okay? So if we then keep stepping up 
through the time here, we get up to 43.5%, 49.1%, 49, 4.99, 0.499, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5. We're at a fixed point. Okay, very familiar, and you can see that if we just keep going, here's our plot down here, we stay at this fixed point forever. So if you start the population, uh, if you start the population at 0.2 and have a growth rate of 2, it'll stay at that uh, forever. But you might ask, what if we start the population very high? So I can slide this up to like uh, 0.9, 90% of the carrying capacity. What will happen? Well, here we're over here at 9. And you can see at the next uh, generation, goes way down to 17%. And then it moves up and up and up and up and up and up to 0.5. So if the growth rate is 2, no matter where we are, no matter where we start, the population will always get to 0.5. So that's called a fixed point. But things change if we move R up to some value. I'm going to move it up to about uh, 3.4, OK? Now, if I start wherever I start, if I let it go, what happens is that we get into a cycle. Okay? So the dynamics here has changed with the growth rate. We get into a cycle of, um, this is a cycle actually of period two. And then if I move it up a little bit more, let's see if I could do this, um, and I let it go. We get into a cycle of period four. And then if I move it up a little more, the growth rate, it turns out it's hard to see, but we'll get into a cycle of period eight. So, um, and so on. And if I move it up all the way to four, and I start over here, we'll get what's called uh, chaos. That is, we get a completely an uh, unpredictable time series of population. And it's, when I say unpredictable, well, it's a completely deterministic function. There's no randomness here. And yet, it turns out that this time series is, according to statistical tests, indistinguishable from randomness. So I'm going to show you a little demo that makes this even clearer, uh, a version of this in which I have um, two points. OK, so here I have the blue point, which starts at point 2, and I have the red point, which starts at point 200001. It's a very similar initial condition. And just as you would imagine, the similar initial condition we, the next generation is also very similar, about 0.64. But what happens, I'm now at growth rate of 4. What happens if I start stepping? The two points stay together, but very quickly they start to diverge. And it turns out that they become completely uncorrelated. This doesn't happen at other growth rates. It only happens at a certain growth rate that's called the chaotic regime. So what does this mean? This is a very simple uh, equation. And if we were using this to model real population, and real populations are modeled this way, if we're not able to measure the initial condition of the population precisely, then we could, be on either, we could end up with our model predicting either of these two curves, and they're completely different. So this shows that in chaotic systems, even deterministic ones, there's kind of an inherent predictability, unpredictability, that's called sensitive dependence on initial conditions. So this co complex, unpredictable behavior can come about from very simple rules. And this is really a revolution in thinking that came about in the uh, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. People are still discovering it. So um, it's something that people in complex systems deal with in their models 
uh, this idea that these systems are, in some sense, inherently un unpredictable. You can't really see this very well, but this is a kind of a graphical demonstration of what happens to our X, our population level, as we vary the growth rate. And this shows that we, it, it, this is the final behavior, the fixed point behavior. We saw that period two cycling, going to period four cycling and doubling until finally we get very complicated behavior that is called chaos. Now, this kind of non-sensitive uh, dependence on initial conditions is seen in many real-world systems, uh, including dripping faucets. <laughs> if you measure like some of the, um, the, the frequency of, of uh, the drops from the faucet, but also in electrical circuits, solar system, the weather and climate, brain activity, heart activity, computer networks, financial data, and in people have shown even software runtime can have chaotic behavior. So it, it permeates our world. And so the idea is that the takeaway is that, you know, we can get complexity from very simple rules. We can get apparent random behavior from deterministic rules. And there's limits to detailed predictions if we have a chaotic system. Okay, so that's one theme of complexity. The second theme I want to talk about is in the realm of complex networks. So we looked at some complex networks before. This is a network of um, the C. elegans uh, worm. So neuroscientists have mapped out completely the neural network, the neurons and their interconnections of this, this very small worm. There's only something like 350 neurons. And the size of the... Um, the circle here is a function of how many connections it has. And you can see that it's uh, kind of complicated. And even though we've ma mapped out this entire uh, connectome, if you will, we still don't understand how the behavior comes about completely in, in this worm. So, so even something so simple. So it's kind of the big good question of how, how close we are to understanding the human brain. If we can't under even understand this incredibly small brain of this uh, worm. But this is a network that has certain properties that are common to many networks in nature, which is that some of the nodes have lots and lots of connections, a very small number of them, and most of the nodes have few connections. Okay, similar, we looked at the genetic regulatory network, and you can see that there's these kind of hubs in which there's nodes or genes that have, that control the behavior of many, many genes. And there's most of the genes, though, are not hubs. They don't control anything. And I'm just going to show you a series of networks to show you this sort of common structure of this uh, small number of hubs, many less connected nodes. This is a metabolic network where each node is a, a metabolite, a kind of chemical, and nodes are connected if they are involved in a, one creates the other in a chemical reaction. Uh, here's a food web, so now we're jumping up to a much kind of uh, larger scale system. Each node is a species, and nodes are connected if one species eats another species. And you can see, again, there's certain hub species and lots of uh, not as highly connected species. Uh, airline routes has the same, air, the airline industry has discovered that, that this hub and spoke structure actually is very financially uh, uh, rewarding to them to have these hubs. So it's not just nature, it's also been discovered in uh, te technology. And more and more these uh, financial networks are becoming, uh, having this kind of structure. So what does this kind of structure imply for the behavior of these, soci these biological, social, and technical systems? Here's the power grid, the internet, uh, the World Wide Web, they all have this kind of structure. So there's a whole subfield of complex systems called network science, which tries to understand what are these properties that are common to real world networks and why would all these networks from 
these very different arenas have these common properties. Okay, so there's many properties that people have uh, recognized as being common to all of these different systems. Um, I'm mainly going to talk about one of these properties, which is the long tail degree distribution, okay? Um, but also some of these robustness and vulnerability um, ideas. Okay, so a, the degree of a node is defined as the number of connections coming into it, okay? So we can look at the degree distribution. That is, if we look at the different possible degrees, um, you know, how many nodes have degree one? That is only one connection. How many have degree two? How many have degree three? And so on. We can look at what a random network would be. That is a network in which we throw down a bunch of nodes and sort of randomly connect them. And a real world, this is a real world-ish network. This is uh, similar to what many real world networks look like. Um, what do their different degree distributions look like? Well, here in a random network, most nodes have the average degree. That is, this average notion comes about. Okay? But in a real world network, most nodes have low degree and a small number of nodes have high degree. So that's a difference. Okay? So we can um, plot something like a, a normal or Gaussian distribution to describe the number of um, nodes with a given degree. Most of them have the average. But what we see in real-world networks is not that normal distribution, but rather a power law distribution, where many nodes have low degree and a small number of nodes have high degree. Okay, why is this the case? So this is called the long tail, okay? And it has very important implications for our, the world, since the world really consists of all these complex networks. Okay. So, in other words, complex real world networks are not normal in the sense that they are not, their properties like degree distribution are not normally distributed, okay? So, you know the normal distributions, the idea here like this is human height, these are people lined up by their height, right? That we have um, events in the tail are highly unlikely, right? Most, of the, most, most uh, individuals are at the average, and um, there's very few men who have height above, you know, 80 inches, very few women who have height above 75 inches, very few who have below the tails there. So that's sort of what defines a normal distribution. Whereas, and, you know, we can look at this kind of thing in terms of volatility or risk or what have you, things that, are, that we tend to think are normally distributed. We don't think that things are going to be extremely volatile in either direction. However, in a long-tailed distribution, this is really hard to see, I apologize, but this is the number of worldwide banking crises from 1970 to 2007. And this is the, that's on the y-axis, and this is the cumulative loss of GDP. So these are like the really big banking uh, crises, these are the small ones. And you can see that here, this has a long tail, and events in the tail are more likely than they would be in a normal distribution. So if you model such a thing using normal distribution, you're going to underestimate the big events here. You're going to underestimate the probability of the big events. And this is something that happens you know, because people tend to use normal distributions to model data, okay? Complex networks, they're fractal-like. That is that they, you know, you can look at, I can look at this whole network and then I can zoom in and look at one, you know, some part of the network and the part looks very much in structure like the whole, okay? And that means that at different scales, the network looks very much the same which is called a scale-free network, okay? And why is it that they have this kind of fractal or scale-free structure? Well, uh, a group of uh, network scientists, uh, uh, Barabasi and Albert, looked at this. They published a very um, 
a kind of a landmark paper in 1999 in which they proposed a very simple model of network growth that would lead to this kind of structure called preferential attachment. The idea is that suppose you're thinking about a network growing or evolving. At each time step, if say I come in and I create a web page and I decide who do I want to link my web page to, or who do I want to make hyperlinks to, their theory was that in general, the probability of being linked to is a function of how many links you already have. So the rich get richer. People with more friends get more friends. Um, and this is a very simple model. The idea here is if we start with, say, two linked nodes. At each time step, we create a new node. And it's biased towards being um, linked to the nodes with higher probability. We start off, each one has 50% chance. Just by random, it links to one of them. But now, the one in the middle here has more links than the other two. And so, that one has a 50% chance, whereas the others have only 25% chance of being linked to. And you start to build this kind of structure. And I'll show you a little demo of this, um, uh, which is not this, but this. OK, so if I, uh, this is going to be hard to see. Let me make it bigger. OK, I don't know if you guys can see this. There's like two red dots in the black part. There's two red dots connected by a green line. And I'm just going to run that. If I go once, I add a node, and it decides which node to connect to, biased towards connecting to nodes that already have uh, connections. And if I keep running that, and over here I'm plotting the evolving degree distribution. This is how many nodes have different numbers of links coming into them. You can see that this incredibly simple model actually results in the kind of structure that we have in real world networks. This is not to say that this is the only force constructing real, the structure of real world networks, but it is a pretty good explanation for the kinds of structures that we see. OK. So um, let's see, I just went too far. Sorry about that. <laughs> OK, so, um, so these kinds of networks, well, they are robust in a way. Uh, sorry, they're um, robust to random node failure. So I should say that you know, our brains also seem to have this property. Our genome, our genetic networks seem to have this property. Our uh, metabolic networks seem to have this property. Our bank networks seem to have this property. They, if a, a random node fails, that is, most random nodes are unconnect, are not very well connected. So the the whole behavior of the net, the network as a whole won't suffer too much. But if a a hub is targeted, that can affect the behavior of the net, the whole network very strongly. And this is sort of behind the idea of the, say, distributed denial of service attacks that we see in the, uh, um, in the web. And also the idea, say, in, you know, on a po more positive note, in epidemics, public health officials want to target vaccinations to people who are hubs in the network of uh, connections, social connections. OK, the problem, another problem that we see is that this kind of structure can lead to a kind of cascading failure which we see in, say, uh, blackouts, you know, um, where the electrical grid fails in this cascading way when one, the failure of one node causes the failure of other nodes. Overload a uh, power station, uh, that causes that power station to fail, and its load is shifted to other stations, which then fail, and so on. But we also see cascading failures in other domains, such as bank failures. This is an example of, over a period of uh, a few years of banks failing, causing other banks to fail. And we can, we, people who study this kind of phenomenon see it in other in biological systems, ecological systems, 
computer communication networks, wars, and so on. So this is something that people in uh, network science study as, as a sort of interdisciplinary uh, phenomenon that has common underlying principles. So as I said here, you know, we have these, this distinction between how people mostly model phenomenon such as uh, risk in finance or possibility of failure in complex systems. If we model it as a normal bell curve distribution, we decide that events in the tail are highly unlikely. Uh, but in a long tail distribution, of course, events in the tail are more likely. So this is something that we see in um, complex systems in uh, nature and in technology. And I think, you know, maybe this is ringing a bell for people who realize that, you know, when you get to some level of complexity, catastrophic failures, the probability of catastrophic failures can go up significantly just because of the complexity itself. And so here, this is a, trying to understand why this is the case. So people have called this more normal than normal because um, of the frequency in which we see these kinds of structures, these long-tailed distributions. And you may have seen the book called The Black Swan, which talks about these, this kind of phenomenon also. So Paul Krugman, the economist, Nobel Prize winning economist said in 2009, the year after the big financial crisis, few economists saw our current crisis coming, but this predictive failure was the least of the field's problems. More important was the profession's blindness to the very possibility of catastrophic failures in a market economy. And I think that that, um, that is the idea that this blindness to this long tail, and it's not just in finance, but in many domains in which complexity exists. So, you know, you've heard this idea of too big to fail, but um, network scientist Duncan Watts, very well-known network scientist, said maybe some things are too complex to exist, that we have really, through that complexity, you know, that we all see, makes it inevitable that these kinds of failures might happen. So this is just a, this was, I'm almost out of time, this is a quick overview of some of these ideas from complex systems. There's a lot of other research going on in network science and other fields. And I be, I'm gonna be um, hosting one of, one of these uh, um, analyst briefings at 11, and I forgot which room it's in, but <laughs> you, it's on your schedule. And I'm really, be very happy to talk to people about some of these ideas further. Um, Somehow my last slide got lost. Um, I don't know why, but um, I meant to have a slide that said um, for, let's see, what did happen to my last slide? Um, <laughs> yeah, it's like catastrophic failure of uh, my talk here, right? Um, yeah, so here, I know it's here. Um, Right, so, um, yes, sorry about that. Uh, so I just want to say a few last words about the goals of com the sciences of complexity. Well, you know, the, 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 different people have different goals, but I think overall there's three different kind of general goals. One is to develop new mathematical and computational methods for studying these very uh, highly complex systems. Another is to get cross-disciplinary insights. And the final is to really develop a very general theory of complexity where we can understand all of these systems in some uh, unified framework. And people have called this the, the, the search for a calculus of complexity, or an analogy with uh, you know, something as re revolutionary as developing the calculus. And I think we've made a lot of progress on the first two the third one really is a question mark. I'm not sure how feasible it is, but it's definitely the goal of some of the people in the field. And if you want to learn more, you have a copy of my book, but I also wanted to put in a plug for the Santa Fe Institute's free online courses and tutorials at complexityexplorer.org. And we have tutorials that are, are and courses that are um, aimed at people from level of no uh, technical background all the way up through like graduate level math 
background. So you might enjoy looking at some of those. And I'm really happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. I want to thank you for, for coming here and, and opening this topic up for us. Uh, it, the book, I have read it. Uh, I've read all of the books for the book club. Um, and it is a wonderful uh, tool to help understand not only all of the realms of complexity, but the way that all of the different aspects of complexity actually affect us at the political, economic, uh, the, the decision making. You can, by reading your book, you can have a much better understanding of why we are screwing up so much. <laughs> uh, and, and, and hopefully some direction as to how to avoid making the problem worse. I, I had a couple of, of notes here, and we will take questions, but you mentioned that um, complex systems drive um, a lot of the weight to one end. That is, the, the winners win, the losers uh, don't. And what we see right now is there are eight individuals that own 50% of the global wealth. And that is a, a result of the complex system. The inverse, uh, the inverse of that is that um, it's very, very hard for somebody in, that, uh, in the other side of, to move up the tail. And the systems are basically pushing against it at every which way. And it's not necessarily about the individual. It's this winner-take-all set of complex rules that we are dealing with. And so the point that I've been trying to uh, get across is how do we design systems or modify the systems that we find ourselves in so that the rules don't drive the distribution that way, so it's less of, a, of an inverse log curve. Right. And with that, we'll take some, uh, with, we'll take some questions. Uh, Peter, you've got a mic coming. Please stand up. No, no, Peter, just wait for the mic Peter. behind you. Complex audio. Um, so thank you for a terrific presentation. One, one of the issues that we have is that because it's complex, the models are never completely accurate. And because it's complex, people don't trust them. And every time the model fails, they go, well, I was justified in not trusting. And I'm wondering if you've learned any kind of rules of thumb of how you get people who don't understand the models to still trust them more than, than, than you know, a normal distribution or expecting things to be linear, et cetera. How do we, how do we not just develop better uh, tools to understand them, but better acceptance of believing things like climate models and things like that? Right. Um, I, yeah, that's a hard problem. Uh, I think in some sense, you know, the, the younger generation is, is growing up more with the idea of computer simulation as a valid way to do science. They're learning more about that kind of thing now. And, you know, they say, like in, in physics, the only way that a new f theory of physics can come is for you know, physics advances funeral by funeral, right? And <laughs> maybe it's the same, I don't, I don't know. But I think it's really a, a sort of a mindset um, of people that education has to overcome. And I, you know, in, in my classes when I teach, I, I teach by having students work with these simulations and experiment with them and try and understand their limitations and what they can, um, what they can sort of believe with them. And I think that's a really important thing. And I, you know, maybe you shouldn't believe a model that you that you don't really understand. But I think people also, I don't know, it, there is such a thing as sort of scientific consensus that I don't think the general public uh, sort of trusts enough. And I don't know how to solve that problem. I want to point out that uh, often the models, the purpose of the model is not to get a result, but is to get an understanding of the implications of changes to the conditions, and so we can get a better feel for it. One of the things that's always struck me is that in a complex system, uh, a direct response to what looks like the problem is usually going to make the problem worse. Right. Right, another, it's that our intuitions about how these systems work are not always to be trusted. Jack? Thank you for this, it's wonderful. 
Uh, you may want to defer this till the 11 o'clock, but you decide. Uh, my question is, given the cascading failures and the big cities phenomenon, do you have any advice for software people who are dreaming about leveraging the cloud? Um, wow. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure how to answer that. I think it would involve some more back and forth discussion, so maybe we should defer that, yeah. Mark? So uh, Mark will be talking t uh, tomorrow uh, as well, but Mark was the only person who predicted the 2009 uh. crisis in public on television. Not quite true, but I was only going to get that and the oil price collapse, so. Um, Thank you, this is great. And uh, I just wanted to share an idea with you and maybe talk to you later. Uh, as Brad is aware, and Murray Cantor, who's a mathematician who you might know who is here, is aware, we uh, put forward a proposal for your third goal, a, a general theory of complexity. And it's based on the idea of flows and interactions. And I think that that might be, in fact, the fundamental, the fundamental two what we call actions behind the power of complexity mathematics. Okay, yeah. Hi, Mel. Let me join everybody else in thanking you for a really uh, beautiful talk, as usual, no surprise there. Um, if we're not careful, we could misinterpret something you said uh, in the first part of your talk, and I just want to make sure that, that we are being careful about it. You listed a number of examples like EEG and financial uh, time series that look chaotic. Well, the misinterpretation is you cannot conclude, we cannot conclude from a time series that looks chaotic that the underlying processes that gave rise to it are chaotic because in both of those cases, there, it's not a low dimensional chaotic system. It's very, very high dimensional, quite likely mixed linear and nonlinear, some chaotic, some not. So um, the, the inverse problem of going from the properties of a time series to the properties of the underlying system that gave rise to it is an ill-posed problem, not a well-posed problem. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. That's definitely mm -hmm. true. And, and thank some you, of Chris. these claims are co controversial, for sure. Okay, one last question from Michael. I'm, I'm curious about the role of consciousness. And uh, for example, if we're looking at uh, the banking net network, um, I'm presuming that you know the evolution of that network occurred without any component being conscious of the entire network. And <clears throat> if people become, or if components in any complex system become conscious of the network, does it change their behavior? Um, and whether that's a discovery. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly something that, that can be modeled. And I think it does change their behavior. And in some sense, you know, the, this, the advent of social media has made people a lot more conscious of the network as a whole, though people tend to be kind of siloed into their own little echo chamber networks, as we know. And that can certainly um, affect the behavior of the whole system. So I think that is an important question. Well, with that, we're, we'll continue this conversation uh, with Melanie in room 4011 at uh, 11 o'clock. Another round of applause for Melanie. Thank you. Thank you.